We're back to uh, um, Skype, Teams, Zoom, whatever you want to call it. Bit um, of everything. What should we talk about today then? I was watching um, a video by Richard Mortier on secure web stuff, right? So sort of TLS, but certificates and things. And I thought it might be a good time to revisit this issue of TLS, right? What is it? You know, what's SSL? What's TLS? Where did it come from? Um, because it's, it's everywhere. I was going to attempt to remember what it what TLS stands for. Uh, t t transport layer service. Close, but no. Uh, transport layer security. You got two, two or three. It's absolutely everywhere. It'll be being used for the for the communication we're doing right now. It's going to be used when you go on the web to upload this to YouTube, you know, and so on and so forth. Right? It's used. It's used everywhere. Um, but that wasn't always the case, right? If you went, if you go back to you know the mid nineties. Very little on the internet was encrypted at all. Um, and maybe at that time it wasn't quite so important because there was fewer people on the internet for a start. And we did less stuff like online banking, online shopping, things like this. There were, less, there were fewer credit card details flying over the place that we want to try and keep an eye on. Um, but that is not the case anymore. Right now, we kind of have come to actually expect that everything's encrypted. Um, and when it's not, big warnings start to show, which is not, you know, didn't used to be the case. Um, so actually this goes, this goes way back sort of to, to, the, to the mid and early 90s, right? So at that time, Netscape were using their Netscape Navigator browser. I actually managed to install it on a Windows 98 virtual machine the other day, it took me back a bit. A few people, you know, the NSA had been looking at this, Netscape had been looking at this, other groups have been looking at this idea of web encryption. Um, and they all come at it from different ways, and then you have a problem when everyone comes at something, something from a different direction that you end up with loads of competing protocols that don't work together, and, and maybe none of me end up getting used, right? So there was definitely a consensus that something needed to be done about web encryption, but there was no kind of way forward. So yeah, I fired up um, both Internet Explorer 5, would you believe, and, uh, and Netscape Navigator 3, I think, Neither of which work on the majority of websites anymore because thankfully these websites tell us to get lost because we don't have sufficient security, right? You know, there's fewer websites that support only HTTP now. Those kind of load, but then JavaScript turns up and everything goes a bit wrong. So it was quite a fun experience. Um, I got uh, to use the web archive to look through some old BBC articles, you know, in, in very grainy graphics. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that there was very little on the web in the early 90s, right? So in fact, it didn't really matter. Once Amazon appears and other online shops, suddenly we've got a real need for this. If you recall, very brief recap, right? Um, when you send a request to a website, and for, just for now, we'll talk only about websites, but of course, actually TLS applies to a lot of other stuff as well. You're gonna be sending HTTP messages, right? So these HTTP, messages, you know, HTTP GET, HTTP RESPONSE, things like this. This payload is going to be put inside a TCP packet, right, which is going to give information on things like the ordering of packets and, and some acknowledgement that things have been received. And then above this is going to be an IP packet, which is going to have the destination and where it's going and where it's come from and things like this. And then you've got Ethernet frames right at the bottom, which are very close proximity hardware stuff. If you want to add encryption to this setup, there's a, there's a question of the way you put it, right? Because things like IPsec already exist, so we can already encrypt IP packets, right? And this kind of existed already. But then you, if you do that, then you have... Um, questions over, you know, do all the routers support this, and you've got to set up routers. It's, it's not as end-to-end -end as you might imagine. Right? So that's one, that's one option, but it, it, it's, not, it's not for everyone. Another option is just to encrypt the HTTP itself. So maybe you come up with some protocol which is like an encrypted version of HTTP, which is the same, but also now some of the data is encrypted in some way. Right? Um, and that, the benefit of that is that then there's the web servers and the browsers can control this, so that's good. Right? But the downside is that it doesn't work on anything other than HTTP. Right? Actually, quite a lot of the internet traffic is not web, it's other things. You know, Tor, for example, uses TLS, doesn't use HTTP. So what was decided, what seemed like a good idea, um, and this is where sort of SSL came from, or secure sockets layer, is to put the encryption between these two things, above TCP but below the actual application that's running. As I recall, we draw this as a stack, or we talk about it as a stack, but 
in reality, it's sort of things in other things. I seem to remember doing an animation about envelopes where one goes inside another and goes inside another. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, right? So you have your HTTP data or some other application data here, and that's going to be its own size with its own information in it. We don't care what that is in some sense. And this goes with a TCP header, which is going to add some information. And then we have an IP header here, and then we have an Ethernet frame here, which has a little bit of a checksum at the end as well. So they kind of wrap each other like this. And what we're proposing to do here is add another header in here, which is going to be where our TLS information is held. And then, of course, this information will be encrypted. That's the idea. And so as far as TCP and IP and Ethernet are concerned, they don't know that the information is encrypted because they're not interested. Right? That's just their payload they're shipping off. So that's you know nice and handy. So this was a design principle for this. In about 1994, some, in, some researchers in Netscape developed SSL1. So they, are, they, they put it in between TCP and HTTP, so it has nothing to do with HTTP in some sense, and it has very little to do with TCP, apart from it relies on the fact that TCP reorders packets correctly, right? Because obviously decryption doesn't work so well if you mix everything up. Um, and it was very basic, This was, it, but it was a start, right? Now the problem with SSL1 was that it had um, loads and loads of bugs, right? It used a stream cipher, but it didn't have any kind of mechanism to pre prevent alteration of the packets and things like this. It used only a simple checksum. It didn't have any sequence numbers. So the replay attacks happened a lot. So it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't ideal. It was only internal. It was never actually deployed on the web, right? So very quickly, this was sort of ironed out and they, and they came up with secure socket layer two. This was about uh, at the end of 1994, somewhere around this area, and, um, and this replaces the simple checksum with a slightly better MD5 construction. We know now that MD5 has some problems. Back then it was fine. It, you know, at least we didn't know it wasn't fine. Netscape actually patented this in 1995, um, not with a view to selling it, but with a view to stop other people patenting it so they could release it for free, right? Which, you know, admirable, <laughs> right? Not, not all companies at this time were operating in that way, should we say. In 1995, Internet Explorer was released, right? It's hard to imagine a time when Internet Explorer didn't um, generate headlines and didn't exist, but it actually didn't exist until 1995. Microsoft saw the rise of things like Netscape and thought we need to get in on this web game. So Microsoft released this, or des designed alongside Internet Explorer, this rival technology called PCT, or Private Communications Technology, very similar to SSL, in some sense so similar it's a bit suspicious, but so similar that it was almost interoperable, which, which did make it easier for browsers theoretically and web servers to support this. But as with all of these things, if you have multiple things that do the same function, eventually you're going to have to come together and solve that problem, right? Because it's just a bit silly. In November 1996, then, SSL 3 was released, right? Which was the much improved version of SSL 2 and had some actually incorporated technology from PCT in it as well. This was still Netscape at this time. This was obviously not going to work long term with multiple technologies all doing exactly the same thing. So um, the Internet Engineering Task Force said, right, let's, let's create a working group for this. We'll call it the Transport Layer Security Working Group, the TLS Working Group. And we'll basically make a new version of this that will actually be a standard and maybe we'll all just use the same one. Right? That seems to make a lot of sense. Um, it was renamed from SSL to TLS purely because Microsoft didn't want Netscape having dibs on the name, essentially. Um, okay, fine, right. Um, you know, I, I think Microsoft's practice is probably much improved by now, right? But during the 90s, obviously, there was quite a lot of stuff going on with browser wars and things. So, you know, this was quite heated. This working group was formed in 1996, actually took them until about 1999 to get a proper release out. And that was TLS 1, right? So Transport Layer Security 1. And basically, this is very, very similar to SSL. Minor changes. So in some sense, it's sort of spiritually, we might say SSL 3.1. And in fact, actually, the version 3.1 is sent in the header for TLS 1. What's really improved over time is bugs have been found, protocol issues, various attacks and things have been ironed out. And actually now, it's really quite impressive, you know, the sort of security and the robustness you get from this. You know, it's quite difficult to intercept and fiddle around with someone's traffic. So how does it actually work then? Yeah, um, I mean, that's what everyone wants to know, right? I mean, I've, I've spoken at length now about how it became to being without actually talking We've about it. We've had the history lesson, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I went, the tech I got it? carried away. All right. Um, so what we, what we want to do is we want to have some kind of, pro it's a cryptographic protocol that exists between two parties and they have to agree certain things 
and they have to follow certain rules about message structure and things like this. You know, this byte has to be here and this byte has to be here um, in this order and things like this. The idea being that you can use it to very quickly establish encryption and then use that encryption to bury things like HTTP. So everyone thinks about this in terms of HTTPS, but actually it has very little to do with HTTP. It's actually just a cryptographic protocol that sits on top of TCP and can be used for anything, right? So loads of inter-application communication will take place over TLS and won't go anywhere near HTTP messages, right? So um, I think that's, that was an important part of the design process. So there's a few things we need to do if we want to have um, encrypted communication, right? So TLS then, right? I'll talk in general about TLS. We'll perhaps go in, in a different video, go into detail about how the handshake works. I think that would be quite, quite interesting. Um, but in, in general, what we want to do is we want to work out what ciphers are we going to use, because if you can't agree on which encryption algorithm you're going to use, you're not going to understand each other's messages. Is it agnostic to the kind of encryption? Yes and no. There are certain, certain versions of TLS support certain ciphers. So as long as you and the server or you and the other party at least have one of those in common, you're going to be able to communicate, right? So if I only talk AES and you only talk char char, that's going to be a problem. But as long as one of us speaks the other one, it's fine. Which ciphers are used have changed over the years because some of the older ones are no longer seen as secure and we have more modern AEAD encryption and things like this that we use now, right? But, you know, that's the idea. But it is meant to be interoperable and one key part of this is that, you know, if I write my TLS client in, in let's say, Java and you write yours in C++, they should be able to talk because the message structure is fixed, right? It doesn't matter who sent it. And so actually that's the case, right? You go and you'll talk to a web server programmed in some other language that, you, that your browser doesn't, doesn't know about. It doesn't matter, right? It's just about the, the message structure. So what ciphers are we going to use? Then we need to have some kind of secret key. So, you know, we're going to do some kind of key exchange maybe to establish some kind of secret key or some other key material like keys for use with message authentication codes and things. We need some kind of authentication, right? So now authentication means we need to demonstrate that at least one of the parties is who they claim to be. Right? Now Richard talked about this in his video, it's very, very important. Because if you don't have this, then of course I send TLS messages, the whole point is they're interoperable. Right? So some, some attacker could also interoperate themselves, let's we say, nicely into the middle of the conversation. So <clears throat> it's very important, usually that the server, sometimes a client as well, but usually that the server is authenticated. And this is going to involve public key. Right, so this is going to be public key cryptography, the server is going to have to sign some digital signature and you're going to back this up with a certificate and things like this. And the last thing this needs to do is it needs to be very robust, right? Robust to things like man in the middle attacks, replay attacks, where I just send the same messages over again and try and trick someone into doing the same thing twice or something like that. You know, downgrade attacks, where you try and trick a couple of people having a conversation into using, let's say, weak ciphers or something like this, or weak keys, and various other possible attacks, right? And it has to do all this within just a few messages at the start of every conversation. Because, of course, if it takes 10 minutes to establish this, no one's going to do this, right? It has to be super, super quick. And in fact, as an example, TLS 1.2 does this with two round trips. So client to server and back and server and back, and then it's done, right? So it's pretty cool. Are there any other things used? instead of TLS or has this become... No, uh, no, TLS has become by far the most used for this, right? Because it sits nicely in this, this point between the applications and the TCP stack, right? IP security is used a lot for, you know, VPNs and things because it makes a lot of sense at that low level, but you don't tend to see it so much for sort of just quick end-to-end -end encryption, right? And again, we see TLS all over the place in other, net, uh, other applications that are not... Um, but are not web-based necessarily. So, you know, most of your instant messages will use TLS to secure their communication to the server because why wouldn't they do that, you know? Um, so it's hugely prevalent, it's really important, um, and it's very, very clever, but it can do all of these things in just a few messages. And I guess we'll talk about that in the next video. Does it ever go wrong? Yeah, all the time. Well... What happens if it goes wrong? What's, what's the user experience there? Okay, so, I mean, the, the, the mo most of the time when you go to a website where something's gone wrong with TLS is you'll see a big warning on your screen, probably because of a, a certificate issue, right? Classically, it's gone wrong because they found attacks, not necessarily attacks that were exploited in the wild on, you know, consumers, but, you know, padding attacks and things that needed to be fixed and have been ironed out. 
And then, of course, you have implementation problems like Heartbleed, right, which Steve covered in the video, was a huge problem because everyone used OpenSSL, and that was a bug in their implementation of TLS, which allowed you to extract server RAM, right? So, you know, often it's, it's, it's sometimes it's a protocol fault, sometimes it's the implementation of that protocol fault. But yes, plenty of things go wrong. Recently, slightly less, fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> copying for another 65,528 worth of bytes. Now where are those extra bytes going to come from? Well they're going to come from whatever follows on in memory, in the computer's memory that's there. If we're lucky, that data will be meaningless. It'll be so it's still just you claiming to be whoever you claim to be. And I've got no other way of checking that out, which is why a lot of browsers...